I, I was thinking that um, if all else fails uh, for Michaela, at least we're going to do a great line in radical evangelical street preachers. Um, <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gents. Uh, I'm Johnny Porter. I'm the uh, Head of Humanities uh, at Michaela. And contrary to what I suspect you're just about to see on Twitter, uh, I do actually like children. Uh, I thought I'd get that one out of the way uh, quickly, because whenever you stand up and say that you're in favour of no excuses discipline, somebody somewhere, usually at the sort of darkest recesses of Twitter, uh, accuses you of being in the Gestapo. Um, it's a sort of teaching equivalent of Godwin's Law. The longer a discussion about behaviour in schools continues, the greater the chance that at some point one of the uh, speakers will be accused of being a Nazi. Um, we even have the emails to prove it. So, what I want to do uh, right from the start is to completely de uh the debate uh, around uh, behaviour in schools as much as that is possible. Uh, so let me start by saying uh, that I believe that everybody in this room and almost every teacher uh, I have ever met, regardless of their political or their pedagogical stance, wants nothing but the very best for their pupils. So let us begin there. I also want to be clear that those who oppose no excuses discipline do so because there were genuine abuses in the past. School life in the past looked very different to how it does today. Corporal punishment was common, and little or no provision would have been made for those with special educational needs. Historians of the period uh, have suggested that around a third of pupils uh, from different social classes considered their time, uh, uh, their, 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 t -t -t considered discipline during their time at school to be uh, too severe. Uh, my own father uh, bitterly resents being beaten uh, with a slipper, simply because he was left-handed. However, as uh, is so often the case in the great pendulum swings of history, a natural correction to what had occasionally been an unfeeling system has been, in our view at Michaela, a disastrous undermining in the traditional forms of authority. Rousseau's notion of the inevitable goodness of children had burrowed its way into the guiding philosophy of our teacher training establishments, and indeed wider society. And this was, of course, uh, despite Rousseau himself abandoning all of his own children uh, to orphanages. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, at the time when Rousseau did abandon his children to orphanages, they only had a 5% chance of reaching maturity at the Paris, found, Paris Foundling Hospital. In the decades since the Second World War, we've increasingly seen adults uh, like Rousseau bulk at their responsibilities to correct ordinary adolescent behaviour. This is the sort of philosophical uh, spectre that haunts debates about discipline in schools, and it's the reason why uh, many schools have given up talking about detentions completely, preferring uh, nomenclature which appears at least to be uh, less authoritarian, or in many cases blaming the poor behaviour of the pupil on the teacher. In fact, I know of one Catholic school uh, where they renamed uh, their isolation area uh, as Damascus, uh, presumably hoping for conversion. Uh, yeah. So we must be clear. Discipline and order are not uh, dirty words. When the rules that govern our interactions with each other are brought down, we are brought down with them. Kindness, gratitude and empathy are not intrinsic and brought down by institutions. The contrary is true. They depend upon them. Kindness, gratitude and empathy must be taught uh, by parents and teachers and learnt by pupils. Over time, these actions uh, become our habits, and our habits become our character. As Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. It is as true of kindness, gratitude and empathy as it is of football, chess or computer programming. And the vast majority of schools recognise this to a greater or a lesser degree. Most schools acknowledge that there have to be some consequences for behaviour uh, that falls short of the community's expectations. The problem is that the systems that exist currently are clearly not working. 
And I will go as far as to say that the ambient level of behaviour in Britain's schools is poor. And this is a sort of crucial fork in the road in terms of the argument um, that I'll set out here and which I set out in our, um, in our book. What I've found is that there are adults who, do simply, who simply do not accept uh, the premise that I've laid out for you. They do not accept that the ambient level of behaviour is poor. Or uh, they say that it is poor in a tiny minority of schools, but it is generally quite good. In my discussions with other teachers, and especially uh, adults who don't regularly visit schools, this is often a real sticking point. They simply reject the picture that I paint. They say that I'm setting up a straw man. And all the anecdotes in the world can be dismissed as exceptional cases and blamed on poor management, poor teaching, or a mixture of both. So, how do we know that behaviour is as bad as I say it is? Well, with great difficulty, objectively speaking. You can read books written by people like Charlie Carroll, whose year touring schools as a supply teacher in his uh, camper van he recorded in pretty graphic detail. Or you can listen to someone slightly older and certainly much wiser than me, Tom Bennett, uh, who was appointed to address the problem of uh, disruption in Britain's schools. Or you can read Ofsted's reports on low-level disruption, uh, one which recently found that up to an hour of learning was being lost in England schools each day. Ultimately, though, it is the case that different teachers simply have different standards. And part of this is philosophical. Many teachers are reluctant to discipline pupils because that whole idea of disciplining they see as being authoritarian and uh, inherently lacking compassion. Part of it is experiential. Before I worked at Michaela, I simply did not see talking over the teacher as a particularly big deal. And even if I had, I wouldn't have thought that achieving a system where pupils don't talk over teachers was ever possible. So, let me draw a line in the sand. We should not be happy with behaviour in schools until it is the norm for a pupil to put their hand up before speaking in class. Because to accept less than that is not really to be in control of your class at all and to subject the majority of your pupils to the untrained impulses of the minority. It's my belief that this is a reasonable ambition for every school in the country. Now, if you followed my argument so far and you agree with the characterisation of the status quo, then you're probably going to be someone who advocates for strict discipline. You might put pupils in detention for swearing. Uh, you might have a late detention uh, where pupils who are late to school are kept behind at the end of the day. Or if you're really strict, you might have some consequences for pupils who don't bring the correct stationery to school. And of course, you'll have a series of incentives too. Most of these run on some sort of points-based system which allows teachers to give out credits or merits or even cold hard cash such as Vivo points. A system which allows pupils to buy items at the end of the year. This system of carrot and stick is pretty typical across schools in the country, even if it is inconsistently enforced. The problem with such a system is its inherent ambiguity. What is strict? And who decides? My strict is not necessarily the same as your strict. Some schools will insist that pupils can all bring the correct equipment to school, and other schools think that this is too much to ask, particularly of its poorest pupils. Some schools think that it is right to sanction pupils for not putting their hand up in class. Other schools argue that to do so would stifle pupils' innate creativity and would crush the confidence of its pupils with anger management issues. Where Michaela differs from many schools is the level of expectation and with the consistency with which those expectations are applied. First, we set the bar extremely high. We expect our pupils to turn up to school on time. We expect them to turn up with the correct equipment. We expect them not to disrupt other pupils' learning by putting their hands up before speaking in class. But crucially, we expect every pupil to do so. That is what no excuses means. It means that the same rules will apply to you whether you're rich or poor, black or white, two parents or no parents at all. 
Because the argument that I want to set out here is that if you are not a no excuses school, then you are necessarily a some excuses school, where you are prepared on occasion to flex the rules to the background of a particular child. You believe in different standards for different pupils. So, you're probably thinking, how does this work uh, in practice? Well, a classic example of this would be a boy who arrives with you uh, in year seven from primary school. We'll call him Tom. He's had a disruptive upbringing. His dad is nowhere to be seen, and his mum struggles to control him and his brothers. To a large extent, they do what they want. They swear at their mum when she tells them to eat their dinner. They stay out in the park well out after dark. And occasionally, they use violence, both in and out of the school, to get their way. Most schools in challenging areas have kids like this. A Some Excuses school argues that Tom's background explains why he behaves like he does. And they're right. It is no coincidence that Tom throws chairs around the classroom. What is at stake here is whether you think Tom is capable of changing. We do. But also whether you're prepared for Tom's behaviour to affect the other 30 pupils in his class. We aren't. And the way this works in practice is really very simple. We treat Tom just like we would treat any other child in the class. When he arrives in year seven, we give him a pencil case with all the things that are required for a day at Michaela. Two black pens, one green pen, one blue pen, a 30 centimeter ruler, an HB pencil, an art pencil, and a rubber. If Tom loses one of these items, which he surely will, he's able to go to the stationery shop at the beginning of a school day to buy a new item for himself. The items are cheap. 10p for a pencil and 20p for a pen. Tom has to learn that losing these items will cost him money and is also inconvenient. Getting new equipment means he has to queue at the beginning of the day. If he arrives to his form without one of the pieces of equipment, then his form tutor will put him in detention at lunchtime. His tutor will make sure to remind Tom why we have the system that we have. If there was no sanction, then every teacher would have to give Tom a pen at the beginning of the lesson, and more importantly, Tom would never learn to value his possessions or the organisational habits he will need in later life. The other way this works is in the classroom. Our expectation is that pupils should be silent unless they've been asked to answer a question or work with their partner. The reason for this is because pupils hate ambiguity. If you say, work quietly, what you get is a range of opinions from silent through to really very loud. And what you see in classrooms like this is teachers desperately reminding pupils to keep the noise down by shushing them and intermittently having to shout over the din, Year 8, this is far too noisy! <laughs> it's a common feature of supposedly quiet classrooms. The problem with it is that it invariably leads to pupils getting into trouble. And what's worse is that it really isn't their fault. The expectations uh, were not made clear enough by the teacher. When you think about it, how quiet is quiet? At Michaela, we remove this ambiguity by expecting silence, unless we've asked otherwise. Usually, this would be to answer a question or to work briefly with a partner. Most people like this. They recognise what people have recognised for centuries, that it's easier to concentrate when there aren't people chatting next to you. Our autistic pupils particularly revel in it. For them, the ambient noise in their primary schools made concentrating very difficult indeed. However, a few pupils, like Tom, find it difficult. It's not that they can't work in silent, silence, it's just not a habit. And the only way to change these habits is nagging and positive reinforcement, celebrating those pupils who put their hands up before speaking and sanctioning those who do not. What the best teachers do is they catch Tom being good. When he does put his hand up, he is praised. Well done, Tom, for putting your hand up before speaking. I'm going to give you a merit for that. It's so important that we don't disturb other people's learning. Tom knows why he's been singled out and praised. And he's reminded why the rules exist at all. It's not arbitrary. It's there to allow everybody to be taught together. 
Sometimes, though, Tom's bad habits from primary school do get the better of him. He turns to the pupil next to him to whisper the answer to a question that he was desperate to answer himself. But I don't want to know whether Tom knows. Uh, I want to know whether his partner knows. I've deliberately asked her because I'm concerned that she's not being concentrating. What am I to do? At Michaela, the answer is simple. It's a demerit. I explained to Tom, Tom, we can't have people speaking when they want. It would be chaos otherwise. That's a demerit. Again, I narrate the behaviour and I explain why it is that he cannot behave in this way. And this is important. To impose a sanction without explaining the reason for it would be like a policeman on the street giving you a fine but not telling you what it's for. It's one of the reasons why no excuses discipline, badly done, can be very bad indeed. For the vast majority of pupils, this sort of mixture of carrot and stick is enough to change their behaviours. They start with us in year seven, barely able to maintain eye contact, shake hands, or put their hands up in class without shouting out. Within a few weeks, they've transformed. If Tom disrupts the class again and gets two to two demerits, he'll find himself in detention. But it's easy to overstate how punitive this really is. Half an hour in silence, catching up with missed work or getting ahead of the rest of the class. There are writers' camps in Shoreditch that are more disciplinary. But what about those pupils who continually push against the system? What happens if Tom continues to disrupt his class? The response to the teacher is simple. And it's exactly the same each time. Tom, you are continuing to disrupt the class. You've had two demerits already. I can't allow your behaviour to uh, obstruct from the learning of others. Please stand outside. It's not mean. It's not cruel. It's not vindictive. It's professional. It's straightforward. It's no excuses. I've not made a special exception for Tom. I've held him to the same high standards as everybody else. This time, he's not been able to reach those standards, and so he'll work for the rest of the lesson elsewhere. Because as much as I desperately want Tom in my lesson, I cannot allow a minority of one to affect the majority of 30. And that is what no excuses discipline looks like in practice. It's the belief that Tom is capable, over time, of reaching the standards as everybody else. To hold him to a lower standard because of his background would be to acknowledge that there were some excuses, some excuses which prevented him from behaving. It would be to have different standards for different pupils and to run the risk that a minority set the level of behaviour for the majority. Now, I've deliberately left this uh, as brief as possible because I dare say there'll be the odd question. Um, I know it's not a controversial topic. Um, so, sorry? Uh, yeah, I'll take some questions. Yeah, go. Um, okay, how do you draw the distinction between authority and authoritarian? Hmm. So I think one of the big um, challenges that we have to get over... Um, in the sort of modern Western world, is that there is uh, a tension between order and discipline and human flourishing. Lots of people say, uh, well, any sort of authoritarian or ordered or disciplined system crushes children's uh, independence, their creativity, it crushes them to be who they want to be. This is completely the wrong way of looking at it, because the contrary is true. If we want our pupils to grow up, as uh, rational, as um, kind, empathetic uh, pupils who have a wide uh, body of knowledge at their fingertips, they desperately need the order of a school like Michaela, uh, which um, rewards them for uh, their good behaviours and sanctions them for their bad behaviours. Um, does that answer the question? Does it answer the question? I don't know. Um, another one. Um, can you just talk through, I think we've got some questions about the logistics of our reward system, demerits, detentions. So um, uh, how do we log it? Do we specify the demerits? How many demerits equals a detention? How long do detentions last for? Do they get carried over between classes, etc.? Uh, so uh, 
very basically, um, a very small uh, sort of infraction like um, not putting your hand up before speaking would be a demerit, as I said. Um, if two of those happened in the same lesson, that would be a detention. Um, and if there was a further demerit in the lesson, so three demerits, uh, they would be asked to stand outside. And they would uh, have the rest of the lesson uh, taught uh, separately or, or learning separately. They would be um, uh, elsewhere in, in isolation. Um, in that time, they're still learning. They're still um, self-quizzing with their knowledge books. Um, so as far as possible, um, the pupil is not um, being disadvantaged uh, from being outside of the lesson. Um, that's the, those are the, that's the, the, the basics uh, of the demerits and how they accumulate. Do we record how, what they're for and where do we record them? So we um, have um, some software that we use, uh, which is very good, called Reward. Um, for very, very minor things, like not putting your hand up before speaking, uh, we wouldn't make a note of exactly what the situation was. For a more serious thing, rudeness towards a teacher, for example, uh, a comment would be made on Reward, um, and it would be marked uh, by the teacher. So I would write the comment, um, X pupil was rude to Y teacher, and I'd write JP at the end. And so if we need to go back to that, um, uh, record, we, we've, we've always got it there. Okay. Um, do you have any children that constantly push the boundaries despite the demerits, sanctions and detentions? Yeah, I think that like all schools, um, we do. And I think what is completely different, or what is very different about what we do at Michaela um, to perhaps what ha happens elsewhere, is that because the um, bar is set so high, there are so few um, incidents that, that escalate um, to the sorts of behaviour that I certainly experienced um, in, a pre in previous schools. Um, Mike, very um, earlier, spoke about a, a pupil who had come from another school in the borough um, who was an absolute sort of nightmare um, at, his, at his previous school. Um, we have found that actually there is nothing wrong with that pupil whatsoever, that he is capable of learning alongside his peers. And the, part of the reason for that is because of the, uh, the, 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 the sort of the fences that we place around the children. Because we say that um, we are going to sweat the small things, that we're going to bother about what pens they have in their pencil case, and we're going to bother about putting your hand up before speaking, we find that behaviour incidents don't um, get out of control. That we, we have fewer of those situations that I encountered in my previous school um, where uh, the pupils, like the one that Mike spoke of um, earlier, uh, get, get angry, and then you start to get into much, much more serious physical violence. And that's not something that, um, that we uh, have to deal with uh, at all. Kevin at the back. Kevin. I knew I shouldn't have asked you. To help a young lad slouching in the street or whatever, what do you do? You find out that maybe the week before his brother was stabbed to death or something in a fight, something like that. You maybe have a young year, year seven, who wants to answer a question, send the answer out loud or whatever. Do you absolutely 100% always basically stick by the policy of the school? Or does the teacher exercise a degree of autonomy? Do they make a professional judgment call on that? Or is there no space to trust the teacher to make that judgment call in an individual situation? The short answer um, is that no. There, I there isn't um, the space for um, teachers to make their own decisions on um, issues like that. And I'll tell you the reason exactly why. It's because we've thought very hard about um, the system that we have and the situations and, and sanctions that should be applied. The reason why we believe that even if there is something awful going on in a pupil's home life, um, that we should always do exactly the same uh, and give them exactly the same sanction as we would give any other pupil in the school is because one of the unintended consequences of the discretion that you are talking about, which you allude to, is um, pupil um, p teachers unconsciously um, lowering their standards for certain pupils from certain backgrounds. And the problem with that is that it becomes a vicious cycle. Because if I say, if I find out that a pupil um, was 
um, has, 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 has an awful home life, which many of our pupils do. And I drop my standards for that pupil. I don't expect that pupil to do their self-quizzing. I don't expect that pupil to get an A in their GCSE. If, if I am to uh, collude in that culture of expectations, then I can be absolutely sure that that's what will happen. And what we're saying is the opposite of that. We want to hold all of our pupils, regardless of their background, to the same standards, because that is the only way in which we can be sure that they will um, break out of, uh, of, of you know, some, the, some of the problems that they might have in their home life. Johnny, do you think uh, No Excuses has a place in AP or PRUS, alternative provisions or police referral units? Am I right? Yeah, what's really interesting, and I, m I must confess, I've not actually ever been into um, a PRUS, so I, I don't know, and I can only base my, my comments on uh, experiences I've had with other teachers. I have, I have been told that if you go into a PRU or if you go into alternative provision, what you often see are standards, uh, expect, standards for, of behaviour and expectations set by the staff there that are actually a lot higher than you would find in a mainstream school. The people who work in alternative provision and in uh, people referral units understand what we understand, which is that it's only through routines and consistently high expectations that those pupils uh, can change their habits. And there is habits. This is the, the, the important thing. As Mike said earlier, there is nothing in the water supply of northwest London that means that those pupils do not have the ability to put their hand up before speaking. It is an issue of habit, and it is our responsibility as teachers, as some of the adults in their lives, to try and help them to change those habits. There's some hands up over there. Okay, yeah. Um, I don't mind who you take. You can um, lady in the blue shirt. Could you speak up, please? How would you assume the um, reasonable excuses class for minor disruptions and the dropping of a pencil case anywhere? Are they likely to be reasonable excuses? Okay, so the dropping of a, of a pencil case, for example, I think, um, I think that there are are instances when we would demerit for a child um, put, uh, dropping their pencil case only if we felt that it had been done as a sort of a, a way of sort of subverting uh, the teacher, you know, that, oh, that the whole of the second row were sort of pushing their pencil cases off the table to try and sort of get one over on the teacher. I think in that case we would. I think if it was an accident, I think I don't see any reason why we would, de we would demerit them at all. Um, lady um, just in fr um, next to Bodle. Um, no, I don't think we dismiss them as myth. I think that um, we, um, we say that the number of pupils who cannot change their habits because of a medical um, uh, disability uh, or difference in ability um, is incredibly small, ex exceptionally small. And I would say that... I think we would, all, we, would, we would all accept that there are an exceptional case, a small number of cases, um, where it might not be possible uh, for a pupil to be educated uh, in the same class as um, the, the, the other 30 pupils. I'll give you an example. I had a friend uh, when, I was in, when I was at school um, who had Tourette's. And he was, his, his Tourette's was so mild that it, he was able to be taught in the same class as me. It, it wasn't an issue. It did not affect the learning of the other people in the class. Um, our autistic pupils revel in the silence that we have in our corridors and they revel in the silence that we have in our classes. It's in, those in those cases, it is no problem for them whatsoever. Can I imagine a small minority of cases where it, that would be impossible? Yes, I can. Um, do I think that those pupils should have huge amounts of care and resources and time given to them by the state uh, and by those that work in um, special educational needs, special schools, etc., etc.? Yes, I do. It is not to, to, to hold a no-excuses policy and to say that we um, you know, should have higher standards generally in schools um, and to say that in a, a, you know, a minority of cases, some pupils may not 
may not be able to work within that is not to ostracize them um, and not to say that they are any less good. Um, it is just to say that uh, we need to spend more care and more time with them elsewhere. Sorry? Well, as I said, we find that m all, many pupils who other schools have written off as not being able to be taught in uh, a mainstream school revel in, our sc revel in our silent classrooms, revel in our silent corridors. Um, it is one of the uh, ironies, if you like, of a no excuses policy, which is uh, pilloried for being exclusive and for getting rid of these pupils. The irony is that actually, if you, if you and schools around you take such a uh, behaviour policy, those pupils are able to learn inclusively with everybody else. If you have silent classrooms, um, autistic pupils who might have found that noise I certainly, I used to teach loads of autistic pupils who found the noise incredibly oppressive, the ambient noise in corridors and classrooms. They are at peace. They are, it's total solitude for them in uh, Michaela. And that's the sort of thing that we, uh, we aspire to. Good question. Johnny, can I get one in? There's quite a lot being asked about um, Key Stage 4 and will our behaviour um, policies stay the same? How would, for example, a lively seminar-style debate needed for A-level history happen within the Michaela system? I, I don't think that there's, I mean, I've, I've debated before and I, every time I've debated, um, I stand up and, you know, make a point of information. Uh, I, I don't blurt out my point in an open debate. Um, I don't see anything, it's certainly not in terms of, uh, you know, how a classroom would work that would alter uh, the fact that it is right to put your hand up before speaking within groups of people. Um, I think if, you, if, we, if you're asking a question about what, how the behaviour policy um, will look uh, when we have sixth form, um, I, the, the, the quick answer is I don't know. Um, I don't know whether we would have exactly the same uh, expectations, uh, for example, moving in corridors with our 18-year-olds as we would with our 11-year-olds. I think that, like lots of things in the school, that's a sort of decision that we're going to have to uh, make at a future point, and I'm sure there'll be lots of discussion about it. Uh, gentleman here. Yes, we'll see you around the detentions. And also, if a pupil doesn't want to go to detention, then what happens? Um, so we have detentions. We have 20 minutes, um, or about 20 minutes, 25 minutes uh, at lunchtime. Um, so they miss their lunch break if they are in detention. And then we have detentions after school in units of about 20 minutes. So if, you, if a pupil, for example, got two detentions in the morning, they would do one at lunchtime and then one after school. Um, so what's the second question? So what happens if they don't want to go to school? If they don't want to go? <laughs> do you know what? It's never happened. <laughs> I don't, I don't, we've never had a pupil refuse to go to detention. Uh, it's, it, was, it would be so odd uh, that I can't even, I can't even, I don't, have no idea. Ms. Bebblesing? Oh, we need to wrap it up. Okay. Um, one, is that it? Kaput? Okay.